give a minute to Darren to settle in. He had a late night for some reason last night. <laughs> but welcome to all of you to this annual meeting of the North Carolina State Bar Council. <clears throat> we'll call this meeting to order the reading of the Ethics Act. Warning. Members of the council are hereby advised of their duty under the State Government Ethics Act to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts and are instructed to refrain from participating in any matter coming before the council with respect to which there is a conflict of interest or appearance of conflict. We have any to note at this time. Thank you. I'd like to remind all of you that this meeting is being live streamed on our YouTube channel, so please behave. <laughs> Time, I will call on our Vice President Marcy Armstrong to open us with the invocation. That comment was probably directed at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, before we pray, as we are entering this Thanksgiving season, I just want you all to know how much everybody in this room has appreciated all of your service to the bar, um, to the, the people of North Carolina. We're just very, very thankful for everyone in this room, if we could pray. Dear God, when we stand at the beginning of a new day, bless us with vision to see the best of things to come, wisdom to make good decisions, and most of all, faith that you are walking with us every step of the way. Amen. I'd like to recognize some of our special guests that are here this morning, some of whom you will hear from later in the meeting. We have our Chief Justice Paul Newby and his assistant Liz Henderson. We have our Bar Association President, John Heil. Can you just wave your hand if you're here? Thank you. And President-elect Clayton Morgan. Hey, Clayton. Kimberly Herrick, Chair of our Board of Law Examiners. Morning, Kimberly. Mary Irvine, Executive Director of IOLTA. We have a couple of our past presidents, Tony DeSanti and Bill Davis. Always good to see all of you. And I believe someone told me that um, Todd Brown's sons are here, perhaps. Here there you are. Thank you. Good to see you. Didn't have enough last night. Glad you're joining us. Welcome to all of you. At this time, I would like to ask Chief Justice Paul Newby to come up and address us. And I also want to say thank you so much for being a part of our installation last night. I appreciate it. That so much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so uh, first off, uh, I do want to uh, say that Liz Henderson is my general counsel and chief of staff. Thank you. So thank you. That, that, that's great. Uh, uh, and also with regard to live streaming, uh, I've been asking for live streaming at the Supreme Court for quite a while, uh, since probably about 2004, but uh, we finally have it. And so when we have court as we did this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, you're actually able to just pull it up on your computer on the court's YouTube channel and watch that. And uh, many of y'all are going, why would we do that? Well, I want to tell you, my 97 and a half year old mother says it's her favorite program. <laughs> and she said, who knew you would ever be on the Hollywood Squares? <laughs> uh, I do think it's an access to justice uh, thing, and I appreciate y'all uh, live, sc live streaming this. So last night, Barbara did such a great job uh, reminding us of the uh, really challenging circumstances of uh, really from February 2020 uh, going through even today. And she said, strong enough. That was her thing. Uh, that uh, somehow we have made it as far as we have uh, with the wheels of justice continuing to turn. Uh, my theme this morning is I appreciate you. Uh, when uh, I got elected, making I thought and prayed, okay, what do we want to do? And one of the first things, of course, uh, was to turn to our state constitution. As I've said before, uh, you know, what's our polar star? The courts shall be open. 
Justice shall be administered without favor, denial, delay, Article 1, Section 18. Uh, how, how do we do that during an epidemic? Um, so, uh, you know, when I think about the folks that kept the courthouses open, uh, yes, the judges, yes, the lawyers, that was recognized last night by Barbara as it should have been, but it was also, and I would argue, uh, essential for all the unsung heroes, the deputy clerks, the assistant clerks, the magistrates, the bailiffs, the court reporters, the uh, trial court administrators, all these folks who help us be in the right place at the right time so that justice can be administered. So uh, certainly my approach has and will continue to be that I want local folks to make decisions about what's best, uh, but also I want to provide protection. So I talked to the governor. I said, Governor, these are essential frontline workers. We have a constitutional mandate. Please provide for courthouse personnel whatever uh, um, uh, safeguards may be available. Uh, but the other thing that Mike and I wanted to do was to go to every courthouse and say thank you to these folks. Uh, I mean, imagine February, March 2020, we didn't know what COVID was. I mean, I thought it was gonna be like the swine flu of 2010, 2011, whenever it was, and you know, kind of a blip on the radar screen and you move on. <laughs> uh, how wrong I was. Uh, I do think, okay, I do think based on all the uh, information and I try to uh, do a deep dive every day, uh, I do think uh, that we have uh, begun to see uh, a decline. Uh, the percentage positive numbers are looking better. Uh, I think it's in the 6.5% uh, and I do think uh, because of uh, various factors that we're going to see us return quickly to our May, June numbers um, hopefully get even better than that. I do think it's gonna be like the flu. I don't think it's ever gonna go away. I think it's gonna be something we gotta deal with. And who knew there would be a disease that for some people it's nothing and other people like our dear friend David Friedman, I mean, they die. I mean, my goodness, uh, who knew that there would be a disease like that? So anyway, as, as we think about courthouse safety but as we think about the courts shall be open, think about if the courts are not open, what happens? Uh, we had COVID hit the domestic violence unit over at, uh, in the Durham courthouse. And to their credit, all the surrounding counties took those emergency calls, issued those emergency uh, protective orders. Uh, but just think about uh, you're in Durham and you need a domestic violence protective order and you call the courthouse that says, sorry, COVID, we're closed. What do you do? Uh, um, you know, if, if you need, uh, you know, for whatever your dispute may be, you need to get into the courthouse. And if you're denied that, look at, look at countries around the world where they don't believe that they can get into a courthouse and get some justice. What do you have? You got self-help. Uh, you got vigilanteism. So the courts shall be open, justice administered without favor, denial, delay. So Macon and I have uh, now gone to a third of our courthouses, including uh, the Cherokee Nation, uh, just to say thank you. Uh, and not so much to the lawyers and judges, no offense, but to what I call the unsung heroes, uh, the people who truly make our courthouses work. And you know, as we go, go around, we give them lapel pins from the judicial branch, uh, for those that are long-serving, I call them long-suffering, uh, uh, we have just a, a little card that we've printed up to tell them a special thank you. Do you know folks are posting those things on their walls, they're framing them, they're, uh, they just, they, they so desire to hear the words, we appreciate you, we appreciate you. And as I've gone around to uh, these counties, uh, the thing I have most uh, continued to be uh, uh, challenged with is how diverse we are. Uh, I mean, even you go from Wake to Orange County, or go Orange to Chatham, uh, uh, Chatham over to Alamance. Uh, one size does not fit all. 
uh, the, the practice challenges in each of those courthouses, the courthouse environment, the courthouse families, they're just all different. Uh, I had the privilege of starting a practice in the western part of the state, uh, in Asheville, although we covered all of western North Carolina. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I'd grown up in the Piedmont, uh, practiced in the Piedmont, and then uh, the last part of my uh, legal career uh, was in eastern North Carolina, and now I'm a recovering lawyer, right? Isn't that what judges are? We're recovering lawyers. But as I think about uh, all those different experiences, uh, I love the, uh, uh, communi the uh, community differences that exist. I mean, you go up to the Northeast and it's the high titers, and uh, you're trying to be sure you're understanding what they're saying. So as a Piedmonter, I was practicing in the Asheville area, and I got a call one day, and this lady says, uh, boy, can you draw up a deed for me? I said, yes, ma'am, I can do that. Uh, I said, I need to know uh, uh, who's going to be given the, the, the property or selling the property. She said, well, that'd be me. I said, all right, that's, that's great. Uh, uh, what's your name? She said, well, my name is Murray Jones. I said, Murray. M-U-R-R-A-Y, Murray. She said, are you educated? <laughs> I said, well, well I, I did go four years to school and then three more to law school. I, I, I think I am. She said, well, how come you can't spell? I said, what, what, what do you mean? She said, every fool knows that Murray is M-A-R-Y. <laughs> Murray, okay. <laughs> I, you know, just the differences the differences, uh, but I celebrate those differences. Uh, and I, the, the one thing I want y'all to know through my experiences is we have amazing committed courthouse personnel, folks that are truly, truly desirous to meet our constitutional mandate that justice will be administered without favor and without denial and without delay. Uh, my message to them is, I appreciate you. So when somebody says, I appreciate you, uh, if you're from the South, you know it's beyond, I appreciate your whatever you may be doing. It's much more general, I, I appreciate you. Uh, if you look in uh, uh, most uh, dictionaries, uh, they will wrongly say that there's no plural of you. Of course, in the South, we know that the plural of you is y'all. And if we really want to include everybody, it's all y'all, right? Uh, I actually you know all these differences, but they needed to hear, I appreciate y'all. Uh, magistrates, oh my goodness, I spoke at their conference last week. Talk about the, uh, I think, the unsung heroes. They stand between every citizen and governmental power. They make decisions about probable cause that allow the government to step in and seize a person or seize a property or search. That, uh, is there a more important judicial function than weighing probable cause? I go around and speak to schools. I always uh, talk to them about the role of magistrates in a case we had early on uh, uh, with regard to a probable cause determination by a magistrate. Uh, one of the things that we have tried is to bring a little more dignity to the role of magistrate. And we did an experiment through our professionalism commission by providing robes. Uh, we, Guilford and Nash County were the two counties that said, we want robes for our magistrates. We sent them robes. And not surprisingly, people respect somebody in a judicial robe a whole lot more than they respect somebody just in street clothes. But you know what else it does? It helps the magistrate step into that significant role as a judicial official. They're putting on that robe of justice. That robe that like Lady Justice shows, blindfolded, can't see who comes before, rich, poor, powerful, not powerful, government, private citizen, everybody treated the same. Um, so I think we're gonna find funding to provide robes for all magistrates in the state because it helps across the board for that role in our uh, judicial system to be properly recognized. Uh, my 
uh, humble suggestion to y'all is please think about ways to honor your courthouse personnel. Um, they have been heroic. We have asked them to interact with the public who may or may not be carrying COVID, with coworkers who may or may not be carrying COVID, in spaces that don't allow for social distancing, uh, and particularly in a time when we weren't even sure how the disease was uh, being uh, transmitted. Uh, and I appreciate you, it goes a long, long way. Uh, so I encourage you as you encounter your courthouse personnel, as you talk to your uh, local bars, uh, let's be sure that our courthouse folks are being uh, given uh, proper respect. Because when we do that, guess what? Those long, you know, the, the, those people that are coming in the courthouse, once our courthouse personnel are feel appreciation, they're going to treat everybody with dignity and respect. Uh, they're going to be much more likely to be long suffering with the frequent flyers that may come in. Uh, they, they are, because they're the face of justice. Uh, when people walk into a courthouse, as I've told them, generally folks don't want to be there, except for the people who are there for jury service. We all know they, they want to be there, right? I mean, they're going, wow, I won the lottery, I can't wait, I get to serve on a jury. Uh, they should be doing that because only 10% of the world have jury trials, 90% have judge trials, guess where the corruption is. I mean, it's an amazing system that we need to carefully safeguard and we need to keep encouraging people, hey, serving on a jury is a high, high calling. Uh, but folks generally don't want to be in a courthouse. I told the folks in High Point, I, I would bet the next time I appear in that courthouse, it'll be to open my mother's estate. And I'm not going to want to be there. My emotions are going to be high. Uh, and I'm supposed to know how the system works. Think about uh, Jane Public, who doesn't know how the system works. Uh, she just knows she's having this problem or that problem. One of the things I want to do to, uh, or think about to do to address that, and this is another thing I want y'all to think about, because uh, I see, uh, first off, state bar, state bar counselors, there's no greater uh, uh, role in our profession than to be a state bar counselor. Your peers have said, we want you representing us with the group that regulates uh, our profession. So I, I admire and applaud uh, what you do. But I'm thinking about access to justice and I'm talking to the clerks and deputy clerks in particular and they're saying, what are we to do when folks come in and we know they need a lawyer, but if we recommend they go down the street or here's a list, we know they're never gonna follow up. What can we do? So what I'm, I'm toying with the idea of asking local courthouses to provide space for a triage lawyer in every courthouse. In other words, folks would sign up, and I know Charlotte, I think, already has some form of this, but they, they sign up, uh, uh, any lawyer, first come, first serve, I will be at this courthouse space for this period of time, and the clerks know that if somebody comes in and they've got an issue, they send them to the lawyer. And uh, one of the issues that as I've tried to consider this idea has been, well, what about uh, uh, malpractice insurance? And so I reached out to Warren and Warren just immediately emailed me back about some uh, uh, really good options there. Warren, thank you for doing that. Thank you for Lawyers Mutual looking at that. Uh, you know, the question is, would this help? And again, one size will not fit all. What works in Wake County will not work in Wilkes, will not work in Buncombe, will not work in Carteret. Uh, every community has their local challenges. But every community can come up with some variation of what I'm suggesting that will provide access to justice. Uh, so uh, if any of y'all have some ideas along those lines, uh, uh, access at the courthouse uh, to a lawyer, uh, uh, formulate that idea with your local bar and send it to me or, or Mel Wright with the Chief Justice Commission on Professionalism. Uh, we want to use some of those funds to help fund these pilot districts to see is this an idea worth keeping. Uh, and the other thing I'll say to y'all is, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't corner the market on good ideas. <laughs> right? I need y'all to give me ideas. Uh, I, I'm working with the ACES Task Force, which is Adverse Childhood Experiences. 
adverse childhood environment. Uh, it's it's uh, clear from the research that kids who at an early age uh, encounter these adverse experiences, that they are much more likely, much more likely to encounter the legal system, either as a victim or as a perpetrator. H how can we take this information and make it better? How can we help these young people that have that situation. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Macon and I had a young man, man living in our home who'd grown up in the projects in uh, Houston. And uh, uh, he was living with us uh, during the summer while he worked at a local law firm. Uh, and uh, I was like, uh, are, you, are you doing okay? Uh, you know, tell me about things. He goes, well, it's so quiet here in your neighborhood. I said, well, well Joshua, what do you mean? He said, I'm used to going to sleep with gunshots. Uh, he, said, he said, Justice Newby, if you stood with me in front of the projects where I grew up, he said, to the left and to the right, my peers are dead. Uh, here I am in law school, and these others are dead. And it struck me, you know, I'm so grateful for the Joshuas who now he's a very successful bond lawyer. I can't pay his hourly fees in Houston. But, you know, why did Joshua end up the way he did, on the path he did? And to the left and to the right, they didn't. You know, what can we do to try to reach those who aren't as fortunate as a Joshua? So my, my humble request is, as y'all have ideas, let me know. Um, we just want to make it better better than the way we found it. As Patty's dear husband, Alan, always said, you got to leave the campsite better. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Um, I certainly uh, appreciate uh, the state bar members who have partnered with us in our courthouse tours. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, what we do is we ask for, when we do a professionalism seminar, and we're not doing it at all courthouses, we just can't, but. Uh, we did one recently in Cumberland and did one in Onslow over in Jacksonville. And uh, we recognize uh, some of the real uh, stars of professionalism in your local bars. And uh, as we come to your area, if we do a professionalism uh, uh, luncheon, we will certainly be doing that. Uh, again, to hold up as an example those who have practiced a significant period of time and have truly exemplified uh, professionalism. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell y'all, we've got challenges in those areas. Uh, we recently adopted a rule uh, which, you know, to me is, is a common sense rule that says if you're gonna schedule a hearing, please, please, not please, you must confer with opposing counsel. And we made it mandatory because folks aren't doing it. Uh, that's not the way to practice. I mean, life's tough. Um, in our profession, even before COVID, one-third of all new lawyers had a substance abuse issue. Uh, we live in gray. Uh, we, we take other people's problems and put it on our shoulders. Uh, we should be compassionate. We should be caring. But then we've got our other family and other responsibilities. Uh, 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 you know, show some grace is the message. And uh, so that's what we've done there. Uh, we're looking at a rule uh, uh, in the appellate uh, rules to not mandate, but suggest if you want a very quick response on a motion, tell us what the other side thinks, uh, because that just helps a judicial official make those determinations. Uh, we did say in the rule that failure to do that uh, in the trial court is grounds for denial of your motion to schedule a hearing. And I, I'm not sure that that word has gotten out, so what you can do to spread that word would, uh, would be great. Uh, again, uh, I just want to say I appreciate y'all. Uh, uh, I, I carry uh, the burden of the judicial branch more than I should, uh, but when I can look to your leadership, as I know I can, when I can look to y'all and realize it's not just me as the Chief Justice, it's us together, um, it makes me sleep better. So thank you, I appreciate you, and as you have ideas, please let me know. Good morning.
this time I'd like to ask the president of the Bar Association, John Heil, to come up and share with us a little bit about the good work of that body. Good morning. Thanks, Barbara, and congratulations to uh, Darren. Um, good to be with you. Thanks for having us here this morning. Uh, I know you have a lot of work to do, so I'll be very brief. Uh, a few things on the Bar Association. Uh, when I spoke to you in July um, and when I addressed uh, our membership at my inauguration in June, uh, the first item on our agenda was reopening. Um, that got obviously interrupted uh, to some extent. We were uh, under a hybrid schedule in uh, August and into September. Um, as the Delta variant continued to get worse, we went to a, uh, all back to an all virtual uh, schedule in October. And we are continuing to go on a month to month basis where we're trying to make our decisions uh, for the next month, a couple of weeks in advance so that we can give um, as much chance as possible for the uh, variant to subside and give our people the option to come back live, but at the same time, making sure that we're doing the safe thing for our membership. Um, second point, whatever our format is, our groups continue to do the good work of the Bar Association, our sections, committees, and divisions. Uh, I'd particularly note the Young Lawyers Division, which is always an exemplar on public service uh, and uh, a multitude of pro bono programs, uh, including this year working with our foundation staff to uh, handle the disaster declaration relief in the western part of the state following some of the weather out there, um, Haywood County and surrounding counties. They're doing great work out there um, and all the other uh, projects they undertake, as well as all the other projects that our uh, other sections and divisions and committees um, undertake. We, the work of our third, the work of our task forces um, that arose out of the report on systemic racism that we published last year continues. Uh, we have a task force on the association side and one on the foundation side. Both are actively meeting, both have subcommittees that are actively um, carrying out the charges that were given to them and we hope to complete that work um, within this bar year by, the, by June 30th. For just a note on membership, uh, our membership numbers are better than they have been in the uh, past two years at this point in time. Uh, last year, uh, we did see an impact from COVID and we were on a slightly different schedule, but our numbers this year compare very favorably to two years ago when we were on the same schedule that we're on now in terms of renewals and drops uh, and pre-COVID. So we are uh, very pleased about that and um, optimistic that uh, we will continue to be able to grow the numbers uh, of our membership as we go forward. Real quickly on our foundation side, uh, we have, as I believe I reported to you last time, continued all of the, the projects throughout COVID that we had before. We've converted them to virtual as they need to be, um, and we have converted them to hybrid or other as they might need to be. But the Wills for Heroes, um, the NC LEAP program, the Patent Pro Bono program, the Free Legal Answers programs, um, our foundation staff and our volunteers have, uh, again, just been exemplary in how they have managed to to make it work and continue those programs um, in the face of this adversity. Um, finally, we are uh, working with the state. We're in the final stages of uh, finalizing an agreement uh, to work with the state and the Pro Bono Resources Center on, a, on the housing stability project. Uh, this is the project that you've probably heard about where there's the, the federal COVID relief funding that's coming into the state uh, to um, help the landlords and the tenants who have, who have fallen behind on their rent um, come back and be made whole. 
Uh, what, what that's going to entail is a, is a pretty big lift. Uh, it's going to be a facilitation program uh, with a lawyer in between the uh, landlord and the tenant um, trying to uh, secure the best outcomes for the tenants uh, and uh, meeting the needs of the landlords too who have been um, who have, who have uh, fallen behind uh, in, in receiving their payments over the course of the pandemic. So we hope to have that finalized very soon and get that underway. Um, it is going to be a very big lift. Uh, it's going to require a lot of our volunteers, uh, but we're excited that, that we're able to pitch in and, and help with that. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to address them and uh, otherwise, good to see you and thank you for all your work. Thank you so much. Each year, the North Carolina State Bar has the honor and privilege to present student pro bono service awards, and we do this during this annual meeting in October. We recognize someone from each of our law schools, and they've been invited to be here or to, or to watch on streaming. So if they are here, I'm going to ask um, that they stand up and come forward as I call their name. But regardless, I'm going to read each of these short bios because it, it's really kind of astounding what they've done. Our first honoree is Ryan Kuczynski from Duke University School of Law. Ryan, please come up. Ryan is a May 2021 graduate of Duke Law. While at Duke, Ryan completed over 450 hours of pro bono service, including serving as the active investigations team manager for Duke's Innocence Project and representing clients in Duke Law's Civil Justice Clinic, the Federal Appellate Defender's Office, and the Center for Death Penalty Litigation. Ryan's altruism and commitment to justice was recognized at graduation by his classmates with the Justin Miller Award for Integrity. Thank you so much, Ryan. Is Sierra Lagala here? Sierra, please come on up. Thank you. Sierra is a May 2021 graduate of North Carolina Central University School of Law, where she distinguished herself by her contributions to the Durham community and service as a volunteer crisis counselor. Through the Criminal Defense Clinic, Sierra provided numerous hours of pro bono service and received Central Law's Criminal Defense Clinic Award for outstanding performance. Thank you, Sierra. <laughs> Cristiano Mendez. Cristiano is a May 2021 graduate of Campbell Law. A second generation immigrant, Cristiano has focused his studies, pro bono service, and work experience on advancing the interest of the Latinx community. While at Campbell Law, Cristiano served as the project manager of the Immigrants and Refugee Rights Pro Bono Project and served as vice president of the Hispanic Law Student Association. Thank you, Cristiano. I'm not sure that the others are present, but we're going to read them anyway. Chloe Altieri. Chloe is a 2021 UNC Law graduate. At UNC, Chloe was on the pro bono board where she participated in a broad range of pro bono activities, including driver's license restoration and criminal records expunction work. As the director of the pro bono board, Chloe was instrumental in developing systems to transition pro bono work to a remote format during the COVID-19 pandemic. Juliana Kober. Juliana is a 2020 graduate of Elon Law. While at Elon, Juliana led the People Not Property Project to transcribe pre-Civil War documents of enslaved people in North Carolina including indexing deeds to provide genealogical data for descendants 
and valuable historical context for the community, commitment of over 200 pro bono hours. And Henna Shaw. Henna is a May 2021 graduate of Wake Forest Law. While at Wake Forest, Henna was a member and ultimately executive director of the Pro Bono Society and completed over 590 hours of pro bono service. As executive director, she initiated the Protesters' Rights Project, the COVID-19 Unemployment Insurance Project, and a COVID-19 Housing Eviction Project. I don't know about you, but reading these stories gives me great hopes for our future as a profession. Let's give them one more round of applause. Thank you. I think most of you are aware that we recently lost our beloved past president, Jim Fox, to a short illness ending in his death. His wife, Debbie, is here with us this morning, and we're glad that she's been able to be here. And I'd like to ask Jim's friend and partner and our counselor, Kevin Williams, to come up and share with us a few memories. Thank you, President Christie. As Chief Justice Newby said a few minutes ago, we lost two tremendous lawyers from Forsyth County this summer. One, David Friedman, and two, my friend, partner, and mentor, James R. Jim Fox. And as uh, President Christie said, Jim's wife Debbie is here today, and she was with us last night um, Jim thought of this organization and all of you as his family, as did his wife, Debbie. So thank you for the honor and the privilege to spend a few minutes with you this morning talking to you about Jim Fox. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also recognize an additional mentor, friend, and partner of mine, Bill Davis, former State Bar President, who's also with us here today. It was Bill and Jim who came into my office together six years ago and encouraged me to run for State Bar Council for the seat that was being vacated by Gray Wilson. We have an impressive lineage of counselors and officers from Forsyth County, Bill and Jim, Gray Wilson. I had the privilege of serving my initial term um, along with Judge Mike Robinson, and now I have the privilege of serving with Judge George Cleland. And we both recognize we have big shoes to fill and if the theme from this week, as it always is, is what a rewarding experience this is, especially as we hear from outgoing counselors, when Jim told me that six years ago, he couldn't have been more prophetic because this is truly a wonderful organization and a family. Jim Fox was born in Bethlehem, North Carolina, in Alexander County in 1946 of modest means. I think Jim had 80 people in his graduating high school class. He went to Duke undergrad, graduated in 1968, and graduated from Duke Law School in 1971. And those seven years at Duke that, George, that Jim spent out of state, as Chief Justice Newby said, were the only questionable decision I ever wondered that Jim had made. Jim didn't have any lawyers in his family or even in his immediate orbit, but he was heavily influenced by the Vietnam War the Civil Rights Movement, and Watergate. After graduating, Jim spent seven years with the firm Howry & Simon in Washington, D.C., practicing primarily antitrust and business litigation. He joined my firm, Bell, Davis & Pitt, as the fifth lawyer in 1984 when he, he and Debbie married and he moved back to North Carolina. I described Jim as a lawyer's lawyer a professional to his core, he had the highest level of integrity, and although he was mild-mannered and gentlemanly with his own style, uh, most of the time, Jim had a way of getting things done. 
For those of you who knew Jim, this description I'm going to give you won't surprise you. And for those of you who may not know Jim, just picture this. Jim's office was like something out of a movie set, like a Hollywood movie set. Mahogany bookcases, leather furniture, books and books and more books and law journals and more books. Innumerable plaques and recognition, all neatly framed and all square up on the wall. He had a picture of the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. Jim loved Washington, D.C. And Jim had this Oxford English Dictionary that was 10 inches thick, and the words were so small that it literally came with its own magnifying glass, and it sat on its own cart. One of my favorite memories of Jim was this old leather legal pad holder that he had that he carried with him everywhere, and some of you have probably seen him with it. And it was worn and beautiful, and that's what Jim did. Is, that's where Jim did his legal work. I first met Jim in 1996 when I was clerking at Bell Davis and Pitt, and I worked very closely with Jim during the first half of my career. In fact, over the first 10 years of my career, Jim and I tried several cases together, including two five-week trials. And you really get to know somebody when you spend five weeks in trial with them. We shared four legal assistants over the years. Jim had three special traits that I think some of you will recognize. One was his intellect, two was his focus, and three was his dedication to our profession. Jim was an intellectual. He was brilliant. Jim was probably the most well-read person I've ever met in my life. He was a perfectionist. If not a lawyer, Jim has told several that he would likely have pursued his PhD in history and taught at the college level. Jim's detail-oriented. Jim handled big, complicated cases. One of the cases that I worked on with Jim that ended up in this five-week trial literally had the case itself had its own office for the file. Um, and Jim had this book, and it was called literally the Index of Indexes. So we could find the documents and everything, but the, the indexes themselves had to have their own index. The second trait that was remarkable about Jim was his incredible focus. Jim had an uncanny ability to focus for hours on end about whatever it was he was working on. Picture this. Jim Fox, dressed to the nines as he always was, with his tie just perfectly in place, shirt sleeves rolled up, that leather binder in his lap, and a fountain pen in his hand, writing for hours and hours and hours in his office, never getting up until he got whatever he was working on, a letter or the brief, just like he wanted it. He's laser focused, and he was looking for just the right word or the right phrase. And sometimes late in the afternoon, with his sleeves still rolled up and his hands stained with ink from this leaky fountain pen, Jim would be walking down the hall smiling. And we all knew that some unsuspecting victim was going to either get a brief or a letter or something that was a little bit different than what they'd probably received before. To this day, I still write more than most lawyers my age because I learned from Jim. It's a good way to think. I still use a fountain pen from time to time, and I never would have found Crazy Allen's Emporium, which is a pen store in Chapel Hill, but for Jim Fox. Jim was a perfectionist, and although perfection is clearly an unattainable standard, that was always the goal. Jim Fox was never outworked. For Jim, the statement, the pen is mightier than the sword, didn't ring truer. That phrase was coined in 1839. Jim personified it. Jim handled difficult situations in a very special way. Jim was calm, patient, focused, measured, and methodical. Jim always saw the bigger picture at play. Finally, the dedication to our profession. In a 2015 speech, Jim said, there are no self-made men or women. We, are all, we all need help to get where we are today. In 2012, in a State Bar article, Jim said, making yourself available for mentoring is, in my opinion, the essence of professionalism. I, among others, among many others, are the embodiment of Jim's gifts to our profession. 
but for Jim Fox and Bill Davis and others, I'm certainly not standing before you here today. Jim joined the Disciplinary Hearing Commission Council in 1995, where he served until 2001, serving as chair of the commission from 1998 to 2001. He was elected as a state bar counselor in 2002, where he served for three terms, was elected in 2011 as our president. And when asked how he wanted to be remembered, Jim said, for rigorous protection of the public and the rule of law. Jim was also very active in our local bar, most recently serving with Judge Cleland and uh, past President Gray Wilson and others, um, working to have a new courthouse built in Forsyth County that they recently broke ground on. Jim did have a lighter side, and for those of you who have ever seen some of Tom Lunsford's videos featuring James R. Fox, attorney at law, you know what I mean. For those of you who haven't, I'm sure there are some in the archives here. A quote by the noted educator and scholar Roscoe Pound sums up Jim's ideas about professionalism and our profession. Quote, there is much more in a profession than a traditionally dignified calling. The term refers to a group of persons pursuing a learned art as a common calling in the spirit of public service. No less a public service because it may incidentally be a means of livelihood. Pursuit of the learned art in the spirit of public service is the primary purpose. Gaining a livelihood <clears throat> is incidental, whereas in a business or trade, it is the entire purpose. To tell you how special this group was to Jim, this was included in his obituary a month or so ago. A great joy and privilege for Jim was his association with the North Carolina State Bar. He made cherished friendships across the state as an elected counselor from the 31st Judicial District, chaired state bar committees, and served as president, and, and recently served, and eventually served as president of the North Carolina State Bar. Simply stated, our profession was Jim Fox's calling. I'm a better lawyer and a better person from having had Jim Fox as a friend. Our profession is better for having had Jim Fox as one of its true champions. And to put it in Chief, Justice's, Chief Justice Newby's words, and as my good friend um, Alan Head used to always say, Jim Fox definitely left the campsite better than he found it. If you'll indulge me for just a couple of more minutes, first, I'd like to give this gift from the firm Bell Davis and Pitt to the State Bar Foundation um, on behalf of and in memory of Jim Fox to continue to pursue the mission and the purposes of the North Carolina State Bar. And now I'd like to read a resolution of appreciation and of remembrance for James R. Fox. Whereas the North Carolina State Bar Council desires to honor and remember James R. Fox, past president of the North Carolina State Bar, who passed away on August 15, 2021. And whereas Mr. Fox was sworn in as president of the North Carolina State Bar on October 21, 2011, after serving as vice president and president-elect, each for one-year terms, and as the counselor for the 21st, now the 31st, judicial district for three consecutive three-year terms, commencing in January 2002, during which time he served on and chaired numerous state bar committees, including as chair of the State Bar Grievance Committee. And whereas Mr. Fox served with distinction on the Disciplinary Hearing Commission as a member in 1995 to 1998 and as chair in 1998 to 2001, and whereas President Fox was a leader of the State Bar of extraordinary honor decency and commitment to the mission of the State Bar to regulate the legal profession in the best interests of the public. And whereas President Fox sought to live his professional life in accordance with the profession's core values of independence, integrity, the duty to act in the best interests of the client, and confidentiality. And he did so by representing his clients with surpassing skill and devotion, and by dedicating himself to the profession and to the mentoring of young lawyers serving thereby as a model of professionalism and service to innumerable members of the bar. And whereas President Fox 
faithfully and diligently discharged his duties as a president of the State Bar and led the North Carolina State Bar with a remarkably sure and even hand, bringing to bear in every instance his enormous legal talent. And whereas President Fox was widely appreciated as a serious man, but never took himself too seriously, allowing himself to be lampooned numerous times as James R. Fox, attorney at law, the avaricious anti-hero of several state bar presidential video roasts. And whereas those who had the pleasure of working with Jim invariably and inevitably were touched and impressed by his modesty, his sense of perspective and proportion, and his good humor, qualities that made him a great leader. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the North Carolina State Bar does hereby publicly and with deep appreciation acknowledge and remember James R. Fox, <clears throat> a lawyer's lawyer, and a true example of personal service and dedication to the principles of integrity, trust, honesty, and fidelity. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be made a part of the minutes of the annual meeting of the North Carolina State Bar and that a copy of this resolution be delivered to the family of President Fox. President Christie, I proudly and with great appreciation move that the council adopt this resolution of appreciation and remembrance of James R. Fox by acclamation. Do I have a second? second. All in favor indicate by standing ovation. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Debbie. And we will have that framed and a copy will be presented to the Fox family. At this time, I want to recognize <clears throat> our retiring counselors. And if you are here, I'm just going to ask that you just walk up front as I call your name just so we can get a quick picture and um, tell you goodbye. Charles Roundtree. District 8, Granny Vickery, retiring from District 9, Fred Morlock, retiring from District 10, Ted Edwards, retiring from District 10, Bill Mills, retiring from District 16, William Fields, retiring from District 19. Tom Anderson, retiring from District 23. Mark Enriquez, retiring from District 26. A. Todd Brown, retiring from District 26. <laughs> and Gerald R. Collins, Jr., retiring from District 43. So when Todd gets up here, let's recognize the service of these fine folks. And we won't say goodbye, but till we see you again. <laughs> been instructed not to let Branny speak again. <laughs> you have in your materials the written reports from several of our boards. We do have a couple of presentations and, that we'd like to hear from today and first I'd like to call on Kimberly Herrick from our chair of our board of law examiners and uh, when you speak of unsung heroes Board of Law Examiners is certainly a good example of that. Good morning. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Uh, and I, I would like to say um, I did not know Mr. Fox, but uh, Mr. Williams, that was a beautiful tribute, and thank you for that. Um, 
you've received a copy of our report. I came because I felt it was important to um, kind of give a little bit of information that's not in here. Our last two bar exams, we gave full uniform bar exams as we promised, and the last two were remote. And I don't know that anybody in here has had occasion to take a remotely proctored exam. It kind of sounds like a nice relaxing you know, situation in your pajamas. Well, I'll tell you it is anything but. If you come across any of these recently licensed uh, new attorneys that have taken a remote bar, just give them a pat on the back. I was honestly, I was in the, uh, the command center during the bar exam and um, we will be going back to in-person bar exam with all protocols in place and that is really good news. So um, as far as the bar exam goes, uh, we did allow applicants to transfer without penalty if they didn't wish to take it remotely. The February exam we gave to 435 applicants, which was down a little bit from uh, previous years. I think maybe people were a little uneasy about taking the bar exam remotely. Well, that exam went really well, went uh, very smoothly. So our July exam was 817 applicants. Well, um, that exam went so well, we ended up kicking two points off our passing score, if that's any indication. Uh, we had technical issues uh, that we got resolved, but we just felt like that was the way to, um, if there's any way to, you know, address the situation. Our passage rates were similar to passage rates of previous years being 60% in February and approximately 75% in July. Uh, we are and continue to be uh, among, if not the first state, to release bar examination results, which we did this year on September 14th. Uh, we typically release them around the beginning of September. So it sounds like only two weeks, but I'm sure for those who are waiting to hear, that was an eternity. The good thing is they are now released into their secure portal accounts immediately rather than receiving them in the mail. Um, so they don't have the opportunity for their um, mother to receive their results and prank them on the phone. <laughs> Not that I would know anything about that. So um, we also uh, consider North Carolina to be a popular place to practice law. Uh, we do receive a lot of transfer applications for uh, since adopting the uniform bar exam, we also received 141 comedy applications. And we were able, uh, through our processes, to significantly reduce the amount of time between application and um, the receipt of a license. And um, most members of the Board of Law Examiners spend about 20, uh, 35, I'm sorry, to 45 days a year um, devoted to the service, uh, but we consider the, um, the function that we serve to be really important to the, the practice of law, and we all um, take it very seriously, and we, we meet a lot of people and, and get to, you know, have a lot of hands-on. We, we also, in addition to the bar, handle uh, character and fitness for everybody who is applying through exam, through transfer, and through comedy. And um, we are constantly looking at our techniques and trying to get better at assessing who we believe has the uh, character and fitness to practice law in the state of North Carolina. Uh, it's been eight years since we uh, put in place our military spouse comedy initiative, so we expedited the process for military spouses who are transferring in from another state, and we feel like that has been a really big success. And um, I would just like to thank everybody um, in the State Bar for, for all of their support uh, that they've provided us all along, but particularly this year because the uh, you know, it was difficult, but I feel like we had a really, a really good outcome. So thank you very much, and... Uh, 
Have a great rest of your day. Kimberly, please express our appreciation to the entire board. Um, I'd like to ask Mary Irvine, Executive Director of IOLTA, to come up and speak with us. Thank you all for this opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you today. Um, it's been a pleasure to see all of you. I haven't um, seen so many of you in a long time, so it's great to see you. My name is Mary Irvine. I'm the Executive Director for the North Carolina IOLTA program, Interest on Lawyers Trust Accounts, which is a program here at the State Bar. Um, you have a report in your materials from us as we um, provide each quarter, but I do want to take just a few minutes this morning to specifically talk about our strategic plan, which was just approved this summer. So in January of this year, the Board of Trustees initiated a strategic planning process. Um, the goal of that process was really to create a roadmap for the program for our work in the coming years, consistent with the founding principles and also drawing upon the accomplishments and the opportunities that we have in this moment. Um, the board really spent a lot of time at the beginning of this process trying to learn and talk about our historical foundations and sort of where the program started. North Carolina IOLTA was created in 1983 at a time that states across the country were developing these programs to use the interests on lawyers' trust accounts to support civil legal services and other types of access to justice. Among the other accomplishments of the program in the past 38 years were some really important rule changes that came out of this body, both to make the program mandatory and also to maximize the interest that we receive from the banks. Both rule changes which I think helped to position the program to grow and to make a bigger impact. So this strategic planning process kicked off with um, facilitated meetings with the executive committee as well as the board. Um, and included 19 stakeholder interviews. We also hosted a community forum once we had a draft plan in place to get feedback from stakeholders on that draft plan. And then, like I said, this summer, um, the board did approve the plan and we are now excited to share that um, with stakeholders and with all of you. As part of the process, IOLTA affirmed the vision that we are working towards, which is a North Carolina where all people can effectively meet their legal needs. We are working towards this vision with the mission of improving the lives of North Carolinians by strengthening the justice system as a leader, partner, and funder. As the board considered the feedback that we were receiving, um, worked to identify strengths and opportunities for growth, and also brainstormed that future direction, we really came back to the guidance that's within the rules of professional conduct, um, which calls on all lawyers to work, toward, to work to assure the availability of legal services for all, regardless of their ability to pay, and to support all efforts to meet this need. This is within the preamble, which is urging all lawyers to fulfill this responsibility, and it was referenced in the recommendation, which ultimately, again, that came out of this body, which ultimately created the program back in 1983. You all are familiar with this work, serving on commissions and committees and the council, um, doing pro bono back in your districts, uh, mentoring young attorneys and really encouraging them also to find ways to give back. Um, and we like to thank and we'd like to share with folks that this is another way that you all are supporting access to justice as well by complying with the rules of the IOLTA program, um, establishing IOLTA accounts properly. It helps us to operate our program. So over the course of the conversations and interviews with stakeholders, um, themes emerged from those conversations about the opportunities for IOLTA in the coming years. The board approved five broad goals, and within each of those goals um, are a host of objectives. Goal one is to be a responsive and responsible grant maker that engages in effective stewardship of funds. This really focuses on the program's role as a grant maker. Since the first grants were made in 1985, IOLTA has provided more than $100 million in funding 
for civil legal aid and other administration of justice efforts. With this goal, IULTA really seeks to continue that stable support to grantees while also evaluating our grant priorities and considering ways that IULTA can use our grants to foster collaboration, leadership, and other improvements. Goal two is to solidify, increase, and diversify funding. We rely heavily, as our name suggests, on interest on lawyers' trust accounts. Uh, we do have a few other sources, but this is far and away the primary and most significant source. Of course, it also is subject to the ebbs and flows of the market. So in order to work towards our mission and vision, IOLTA must be involved in efforts to increase funding for civil legal aid and work with the community to consider funding opportunities that are available. Goal three is to heighten communications about the benefits produced by IOLTA, as well as the need for civil legal aid. This was one of the biggest themes, <laughs> something that we heard most, that we need to let people know. We need to raise awareness about the work that IELTA does and that this was critical uh, for folks to really understand what the need is. Through this goal, we would develop a communications plan which is designed to reach all potential supporters and funders and to utilize the data that we receive, stories, and our connections to build upon this communications. Goal four is to embrace IOLTA's leadership role in the justice community. As the only statewide funder focused pretty narrowly on civil legal aid, we are in a unique position at IOLTA to support unity and cohesion and really embrace that leadership role. IOLTA envisions building upon existing partnerships and also investing in our ability to convene, to evaluate, and to lead. And then goal five is really the um, more inner facing role, um, which is to build organizational capacity to pursue these identified priorities. The board it did acknowledge within the process that current staff and budget um, don't provide the capacity to necessarily pursue all of these identified objectives effectively. So we're working on identifying the capacity and resources that are needed, as well as um, shoring up our sustainability and looking to utilize the resources that we do have. That's it. We look forward to continuing to connect with all of you, particularly in the ways that these goals really intersect with the work that you all are doing. Um, in the materials is just a one pager of the plan, but the full strategic plan can be found on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> our next item is our report from General Counsel, Catherine Jean, and and although I expect your usual lengthy report, Catherine, I, I would like to ask you to just step up here because in addition to your report, I thought maybe you might share with us a little bit about um, a, a retirement in the Office of Counsel and perhaps about a new hire because when we meet again in January, there will be some different faces. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, it is with a great uh, sadness that I have to announce that Margaret Cloutier, who has been in the Office of Counsel since 2004, is retiring at the end of the year. Uh, Margaret is um, beloved by everyone in the Office of Counsel. She's, the, she's endlessly patient. Everyone goes to her for her, her ideas, her uh, buy-in when they're uh, trying to decide how to proceed in a case. She has a lot of time to help everyone else and we're all devastated at the thought of losing her but we also recognize that she's been working a long time and she deserves this opportunity so um, that will be a big change for us. Um, we have uh, hired two new lawyers who are here today. Um, we have Tom Crosby. Um, he came to us just a few weeks ago from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Raleigh um, where he's been prosecuting mostly gang crimes. And we have Kelly DeAngelis, who I think is right there behind him. And she's been with us for about two months. And she came to us from the Wake County uh, Public Defender's Office. And they're both already doing a great job. I have absolutely 100% uh, uh, confidence we've hired the right people. We're real excited to have them. And we have recently, two days ago, um, hired another lawyer who will start with us on January the 3rd and her name is Tessa Hale, so we're also very excited about her. We've had a lot of changes in the Office of Counsel because we've had a lot of retirements in the Office of Counsel. 
So we're losing a lot of institutional knowledge and experience, but I think we've got the right people on board. So, um, you have in your materials a report of the activities of the Office of Counsel for the previous quarter, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome to our new folks, and if you see Margaret, please uh, give her your best wishes. All right, we're going to move into our committee reports, and I'd like our first item is the report of the Authorized Practice Committee, and are you going to be giving that? I think Andrea had to get back up the mountain. Thank you, President. Christy, I am very mindful of Branny's cautionary tale, giving uh, any report about authorized practice in the absence <laughs> of uh, the appointed chair. But uh, the report is this, the minutes are in your materials. Uh, since last quarter, 11 complaints were filed. The dispositions included six uh, letters of caution, uh, four complaints were dismissed, and no action was taken on one case. Uh, the prepaid legal plans were registered and no action is needed by this body. All right, any questions for Bobby? Thank you very much. Thank you all. And, and I do um, also, <clears throat> on our same theme of saying goodbye, which seems to be the theme for today, I do wanna let you know that Joe Cerrone is also retiring at the end of this year. His official title is Director of Administration, but he wears many hats, and you most often see him bustling around during Council Week, making sure that everything is right with all of our meeting rooms and things. And I, I don't suppose he's hanging out in the hall, is he? Maybe. If he, we'll just, if Sharon sees him, we'll just pop, have him pop in and we'll recognize. How many years has he served the State Bar, do you know? Over 10 years, okay. So, see a lot of changes. In the Don't see him? All right. Pop him in, see. We will at this point take up the report of the executive committee. And our first item is approval of the minutes of the council's meeting. It was held on July 16th, 2021. Those were posted on SharePoint. Do I have a motion to approve? Second, any questions? All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, thank you very much. And I will turn it over to Darren for the report from Finance and Audit. Finance and Audit uh, Committee met um, and the first item of business is the third quarter financial statements. I indicated to the uh, executive committee yesterday that uh, President Christie was so anxious to get out of uh, office that we moved this uh, quarterly meeting to the 1st of October and still that's instead of the end of October so she could become a past president which she glowed over at the past president's meeting this morning. Um, so the, the whole crux of that is the fact that the financial statements have not been prepared because the bank statements for September have not come in to be, uh, to be looked at. Um, it's anticipated that uh, those statements will be in and we would be able to review those sometime in late October. However, this body not meeting in late October, thanks to President Christie, um, will be, um, it'll be necessary and what we're requesting is that this body give the Finance and Audit Committee the authority to review those and to approve those financial statements once they come in. So that would be the recommendation of the Finance and Audit Committee. Uh, committee. That being the motion from the committee requires no second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you. Joe, would you just come up here for just a moment, please? Oh, we you're just, in trouble now. Yes, you were, you're in trouble now. We just wanted to take a moment to say how much we appreciate all that you do and all your work and to say that we hope that you enjoy your retirement. I'm sure it's much deserved and I can't
again just to say thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next item of business um, deals with the uh, dues for 2022. Um, each year the council must set the amount of the annual membership due, uh, dues. Are, the dues are currently $300, which is the statutory maximum. Finance and Audit Committee uh, is expected to recommend, or is recommending at this point in time that those dues be set at $300 for 2022. A motion from the Finance and Audit Committee doesn't require a second. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. We also took up the appointment of a new trustee for the pension plan. Uh, as you guys recall, John Dorsey uh, resigned and was honored on Wednesday evening for his longtime service to uh, the pension plan. Um, and we took up the appointment of a replacement. It was recommended to us after some uh, investigation by uh, Alice uh, that Gray Hutchinson be appointed. Uh, he is willing to serve um, and we would recommend that his appointment be approved by this council. Ray Hutchinson. Motion from Finance and Audit Committee. Any questions? All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. The next item deals with the restatement of the state bar uh, money purchase pension plan. This is the pension plan for the employees of the state bar. Um, Alice, do you want to talk about that a little bit since you're the pro of it? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, what we're asking in, in the recommendation of the uh, Finance and Audit Committee is that we move this plan from an ERISA plan, whose uh, if you're a member of the Audit Committee, you know that we move this plan from an ERISA plan, who, if you're a personal injury lawyer, you hate ERISA, um, to a government plan. Um, let's see. I believe that at this point in time, that's all we're asking for is those modifications. That would be the recommendation. So we have a motion to approve the restated plan that does not require a second. Any questions? All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? <coughs> motion passes. Part of being a trustee of that pension plan is it comes with a great deal of potential liability. Um, and that's why uh, Mr. Dorsey's uh, service was so exemplar is if he took on a lot of personal liability, potential liability over those years that he was on, uh, on the trustees. Um, at this point in time, because we have changed the, uh, the plan from an ERISA plan to a government plan, uh, this uh, indemnity agreement that we have for the trustees uh, for their liability, potential liability, uh, needs to be restated or, or amended to indicate it is now a government plan and not at ERISA. And also we need at this point in time uh, to add Mr. Hutchinson's name to that indemnity <coughs> agreement and take Mr. Dorsey's name off of it. Um, so that would be the recommendation of the Finance and Audit Committee. And if you want Alice to explain that, we can let her do that too. I think you've done it great. So that motion is before you. Any questions, comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. 
The last item for the Finance and Audit Committee deals with the Client Security Fund. Uh, that usually gets set when the financial statements come in. Obviously, they haven't come in at this point in time. Um, they're usually set, or they have been set at $25, but they've also been set as much as $50. Um, we anticipate that those, uh, uh, that fee would be, a, we would be able to set that fee sometime after the financials come in late October. Finance and Audit Committee is asking for your approval to allow the Finance and Audit Committee to make, to approve those, uh, that amount of money that we're going to be recommending for that client security fund. That's our recommendation. Any questions, comments? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Our next item is sort of an administrative item, and that is to set our meeting dates for the council for 2022. Um, as this affects your lives, you might want to make note of it or make sure it's in your materials. Those proposed dates, January 18 through 21, April 19 through 22, July 19 through 22, and that meeting will be in Wilmington, October 18 through 21. And I certainly hope all those meetings will be live and in person. We have a motion to approve those dates. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Darren, I'll ask you to give us the report of the Appointments Committee. The Appointments Committee took up uh, a couple of appointments. We also took up a matter where we appointed Stephanie Davis back in April of this year at the quarterly meeting to the Disciplinary Hearing Commission for an additional uh, term on the uh, Disciplinary Hearing Commission. Um, at the time, we gave her a three-year term as vice chair of the commission starting July 1st of 2021. It's been discovered that Ms. Davis is in her second term of service, with, uh, uh, and she's only eligible to serve as vice chair for two years, expiring on June 30th of 2023 instead of June 30th of 2024, as indicated in April. Um, so it's our recommendation at this time that we uh, amend her appointment uh, to indicate that her service uh, will expire as of June 30th of 2023. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. The uh, next matter is the Client Security Fund Board of Trustees. There's one appointment to be made. Uh, w. Irvin Irwin Fuller, Jr. Uh, is not eligible for reappointment. Um, we met and discussed possible other appointments. It was the recommendation and is the recommendation of the Appointments Advisory Committee that Jim Dorsett, former State Bar President, uh, be appointed uh, to the Client Security Fund Board of Trustees. Any questions, comments? All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, thank you. Mr. Fuller was the uh, chair um, and the rules governing the Client Security Fund Board of Trustees require a council to appoint board chairs and vice chairs annually. And since Mr. Fuller has, is ineligible for reappointment, uh, presently uh, L. Thomas Lunsford II, who was here last night, is vice chair. Mr. Fuller recommends that Mr. Lunsford be appointed chair consistent with the board's usual practice, and that is the longest uh, the, the individual, the attorney who has been on that board longest uh, usually elevates to the uh, board chair and Mr. Lunsford meets that qualification. We also recommend that Amy Richardson, who is uh, the second longest uh, member of that uh, trustee board, uh, be appointed vice chair. That's a recommendation of the Appointments Advisory Committee. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, thank you. Uh, the next board is the Board of Continuing Legal Education. There are three appointments to be made. Two of those, appoint, um, of in, two of those spots are presently, uh, there are folks who are eligible for reappointment. That's Adrian Blocker and Lee Ann Kane. Um, we are recommending Adrian Blocker and Lee Ann Kane be reappointed to those positions. 
not eligible for reappointment was George Jenkins, Jr., who was uh, formerly of this body of counselors. Um, and in his place, the advisory, uh, appointments advisory committee recommends Dayton Cole uh, to fill George Jenkins' place. That would be our recommendation. Any questions? Okay, all in favor say aye. Those opposed? And as is the case in the last time, um, George Jenkins was the chair, and now that he is no longer eligible for reappointment, uh, it's up to the, uh, this body to appoint a chair and vice chair, uh, which we do annually. Uh, it is recommended at this point in time by the Appointments Advisory Committee that you appoint uh, Elizabeth Kiever, who I believe is a former judge out of Cumberland County, as chair and vice chair Adrian Blocker, who we just reappointed to this committee. That would be our recommendation. Any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. As opposed, thank you. Uh, we took up the issue of the Board of Paralegal Certification. There's three appointments to be made. Uh, Matt Smith and Benita Angel Gwen Powell are eligible for reappointment. Uh, it's the recommendation uh, of the Appointments Advisory Committee uh, that we reappoint Matt Smith and Benita Angel Gwen Powell to that appointment. We also have an, appoint uh, an individual, Patty Clapper, who is the paralegal member of this board. Um, and it is our recommendation, she is not eligible for reappointment, it's our recommendation that S.M. Canodal Hodges be appointed, who is a paralegal, I think, in Charlotte. That would be our recommendation. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? None. Thank you. We also uh, annually appoint the chair and the vice chair Warren Hodges is currently the chair, and Brian G. Scott is serving as vice chair. It's our recommendation that those two individuals be reappointed to chair and vice chair. Comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right. The last matter that we uh, took up is the Board of Law Examiners. There are three appointments. Ron Baker, Calvin Murphy, and Ronald Gibson are all eligible for reappointment, and it is the recommendation of our committee that they be reappointed uh, to the Board of Law Examiners. Questions? All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? That would be our business. Thank you. Next item on our agenda. Um, and I'm going to just include it in executive, although it's sort of an ethics item, would be that it's a motion from the Ethics Committee that we publish for comment a proposed amendment to the Rule Rule 1.01, adding a new comment, which states, again, the motion is that this be published for comment. Coming from a committee that doesn't need a second, are there any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you. We had um, amendments to the standards for certification and criminal law. Those were published after the July meeting and no negative comments were received. So do I have a motion to adopt those and transmit them to the court for approval? Second, any questions about those? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Um, I'm going to ask at this time Catherine Jean to come back up. Give us a report concerning pending litigation and also to speak to us about um, a, mat a special matter on our agenda. Um, you have in your materials the, um, the report of the pending litigation, and unless there are any specific questions, I'll just rely upon the written report. Is that acceptable? Any questions? Okay. Okay. 
Do you want to do this in closed session? Do you want uh, I don't. I don't think so. You can give us an, an introduction to the matter, and if if we have questions that require it, we'll do it. But we may not. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, the uh, IOLTA board has been asked to sign on to an amicus brief in a case called Crack Hour versus Dish Network. This is pending in the Fourth Circuit. Um, the case is a consumer class action relating to Dish Network's um, advertising practices. The issue here is that um, most of the award has been distributed, but the administrator concluded that it's either not possible or not feasible to distribute the remaining $10 million of the award and has asked the court to distribute that as Cypre awards to legal aid societies. Um, Dish Network contends that Cypre awards violate the United States Constitution and federal laws and federal regulations, and um, therefore contends that all of the re residuals should re revert to Dish Network. Um, so there will be a, an amicus brief filed by a number of different legal aid societies, uh, ULTA programs, um, advising the court of why Dish Network's position is the wrong position to take. Um, these same arguments that DISH is making in this case have been made in a number of other cases, but never in the Fourth Circuit. The arguments have never been successful, um, but this will be the first time that the Fourth Circuit has addressed it. Um, there are several um, uh, organizations in Virginia and in Maryland who have already committed to sign on to the brief. Um, so a, a state bar board cannot sign an amicus brief um, without the consent of the council or in a, an emergency, the consent of the executive committee. Um, we don't know when the brief will be due. Um, it's dependent upon things that are outside the control of the people who are filing the amicus brief. Um, but it's entirely likely that it could be due in either November or December, obviously. It wouldn't be um, feasible for the council to address it then, so we're trying to address it now. Um, uh, the brief will be written by a law firm, a lawyers at a firm called McDermott, Will, and Emery. This is a very large and incredible firm that does very high quality work. Um, they've written amicus briefs on this subject in the past. I've read one of those briefs. It's very high quality and it doesn't contain any inappropriate or unduly provocative information that we wouldn't want to be associated with. Um, so, um, because the brief is not yet in existence, I can't read it now and recommend it to you, but um, the suggestion that I have here is that um, y'all um, authorize me to read the brief when it becomes available and give my opinion to the officers as to whether this is an appropriate brief and doesn't contain any ideological or political content that's inappropriate and that it's of a quality that we could sign on to and then um, that the officers would make the decision when the opportunity presents itself. I've looked into the issue of whether there's really any risk to doing this or any reason not to do it, and it's my opinion that there is virtually no risk. I mean, anytime you do anything, there's some risk that somebody will sue you whether they have any basis to do that or not, but um, the case law that is out there talking about um, the purposes of state bars and their expenditure of funds and their use of their name and uh, to promote certain causes, clearly indicates that um, advancement of the improvement of administration of justice and access to justice are appropriate topics for the expenditure of funds and for the um, association of a state bar. So I don't think that there's a significant risk anytime, um, you know, if someone should sue, we would incur some expense to do that, uh, to defend that, but I also don't think there's very much chance anybody would sue because there are no funds uh, being expended here. This is all pro bono work by this law firm, so there is no expense. Now, that's my recommendation. Thank you, Catherine. So this was discussed at executive committee yesterday, and um, in recognition that these Cypre awards are very important to our IELTA program and programs nationally, it was the recommendation of the executive committee that we, that we sign on to that the ALTA board sign onto the Samikas brief subject to Catherine's review of the actual brief and um, advice and approval of the officers. So I would entertain a motion to that effect. I have a second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? 
All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Mm -hmm. And that concludes the report of the executive committee. And as Everett Thompson comes up to give the report of the administrative committee, I just want to say a welcome to Fred Morlock, who snuck in at the back, one of our, our retiring counselors. So. Good morning. Um, I just want to mention to you that I am in the first judicial district, and we have annual meetings at the end of the month this year. And uh, I'd like to be able to tell the members of the, the lawyers in the first judicial district to say that to them, well, you are lawyers in the first judicial district, but actually you're lawyers in the number one district. <laughs> I did want to mention something my Chief Justice talked about earlier, talking about pronunciation of some words, and I think he's talking about my part of the state. So I could tell you that if you went down, uh, we, we cover the Outer Banks of North Carolina, if you went down to Hatteras, and you saw a local there, and you wanted to ask them something like a simple question like, is it, is it high tide or low tide today? They may just refer to you as hoy toyed. <laughs> <laughs> so much for that. I'll be very simple for the rest of this. We, we had our uh, administrative meeting on Tuesday. It was Zoom, and um, we, we dealt with the petitions from uh, lawyers, obviously. And um, what I'm going to present to you is uh, what we basically voted to uh, recommend to the council that you grant the petitions that we approved. Um, and the first thing that, that we went through was petitions for transfer to inactive status. And what we approved was totally 74 lawyers were transferred to the inactive status, if it's approved by y'all, of course. Five were granted upon satisfying requirements. In other words, they still owed some money and they have to do that. Two were granted nunc pro tunc, and what that meant was this is dealing with two lawyers who had some um, medical and mental problems or other kind of issues that they hadn't practiced for a while, and they wanted to make sure that their, their inactive status uh, ended in December of last year. So it wasn't for this year, and that way they don't have to pay any fees for this year. So we granted two of those. And then we had uh, two that were suspended to come back as active, and they'd done all their act, they'd done all the things they were required to do, but then immediately go inactive. In other words, they can't go in inactive if they hadn't qualified, of course. And we had those. And then we had a petition for reinstatement from um, uh, inactive status. No, it's coming back as lawyers, and 23 lawyers were uh, were uh, approved for that. We had a petition for rein reinstatement from a suspended status. We had four lawyers that were granted reinstatement, and the two that I mentioned earlier came back and then back out again as, as inactive. Um, we had a petition for pro bono practice for out-of-state lawyers to come in and do legal free work, and we approved five of those. And then at the end of our meeting, we had a um, proposal for the, for the council to send out um, uh, these issues. There would be nine notices to lawyers to uh, show cause for, for uh, being suspended, and then 89 orders for suspension. Now, if you look in your materials, you'll see the list of all those lawyers, and if, it's, if any of them are in your district, we recommend that you call them and tell them that they've got something coming up, and they need to take care of it. Now, if they have a question about it, and by the way, there's an asterisk by some of them, you don't need to call that person who has an asterisk, but if, if they have questions about it, and if it's a CLE question, they can call Deborah Holland here at the bar, and uh, she's the manager, uh, director of the CLE. If it's a local thing, they just have to call the local judicial uh, folks. But if it's any other question, they call Tammy Jackson, and she's the director of membership. Um, and I think that covers everything that, that we did, and your approval. All right, so we have a motion for approval of the report of the administrative committee. It does not require a second. Any questions, comments? All in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed? Thank you, Everett. Thank you. Dorothy will come up and give us the report on communications. And welcome John Silverstein. Good morning, everybody. And keeping in line with the words, I bring you greetings from Durham, or Durham, if you're not from <laughs> North Carolina. I bring you the report of the Communications Committee. 
Um, we have a new database in Portal, as you all have been hearing about, that will roll out in November. Um, all the information that members have already in, in the database that we, or the portal that we have right now will migrate over to the new database. So it should be pretty easy for folks. But when that happens, we will have a good rollout plan for advertising. And so we need you all's help getting the word out to your different districts and the members there that that new portal will come out. And so we have some plans for some of our staff and people to go out to the different districts and do some presentations to let everybody know how that will work. The courtroom technology study, that is still underway, working on updates to the courtrooms. You all have probably seen and been able to um, experience the new technology that we have so far. And so we're up updating the courtrooms to be even better and equipped with technology that we need in this new day and age, as you all have seen, um, so we can be prepared for in-person meetings and virtual meetings. And then last but not least, live stream, podcast, and social media. I know y'all were ready for this part. Um, we had two podcast presentations last quarter. Uh, one was transcribed for a journal article. Um, Gita Kapoor, one of our um, attorneys here in North Carolina, she wrote a book about the struggle for racial equality um, at UNC Chapel Hill, and that is being transcribed into a, a journal article. So please send Peter any ideas, or Brian, any ideas um, for podcast topics. And Mark has agreed to continue to work with us on those podcasts. We really appreciate you. Uh, we're not going to let you go that easy. Um, so if you have any ideas, please give them those ideas. We would love to hear from you. And if you would like to participate in a podcast presentation, please consider doing so. And then social media. Y'all ready? I need drum roll. All right, so we are up to 2,000. Did we get any more as of recently, Pete? 2,000 Twitter followers. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. And as of today, we have 148 YouTube subscribers. Y'all, that went up three people since Monday. <laughs> All right. That is the report of the Communications Committee. I thank you all. I always like to um, give a shout out and thank you to all the staff, Brian and Peter, and everybody at the State Bar who does all the heavy lifting for us, and it's been really helpful for me, especially on the um, Communications Committee. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Dorothy. It, it is nice to have access to these tools and you know, it made it possible for members of Darren's family and friends to watch the ceremony last night that could not otherwise be here. So it's always wonderful. And um, yeah, that's one of the good things about it. Um, David Allen, if you'll come give us a report of ethics. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I don't, ever get, I don't often get to say woohoo the way that, uh, that Dorothy just said it. I will never say it the way, frankly, that Dorothy did. But um, for y'all may want to say woohoo today because we have no action items uh, to put before uh, the council today. Do have a couple of, of informational points for you. Um, we, the the uh, uh, random audits uh, this year, excuse me, this quarter were for, were for Mecklenburg County. Uh, they didn't quite get through uh, to in order to give us a report about the random audits. So I can I know what I can tell you. The same thing I tell you about every quarter about what we failed on, and the reason that 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 work wasn't finished was not because uh, President Christie moved this meeting up, although Darren suggested that might be the reason. But actually, uh, auditing Todd Brown's trust account just was taking too long. So they will uh, and will continue that work, and that will be finished, I'm sure, uh, shortly. We, we do have two matters uh, that I just want to highlight for you that have, because they've attracted considerable attention. Um, one is a, a matter uh, that you all have probably heard about from some of, the, of your uh, resident uh, members, which is the commenting, uh, lawyer commenting on public information. Uh, this is where um, the CLE folks have been unhappy with us because of the of potential ethics problems with lawyers talking about cases that they were involved in without securing client permission. That's a very interesting topic and one that is um, occupying a good bit of our time. Spent most of our time yesterday actually at our meeting discussing that. That's, that's not ready for action yet, but it's something that you may hear about. If you have interest um, in that topic, um, you can talk to any of the folks on that committee. Evan uh, Rawls is chairing that committee. 
Uh, there will be subcommittee will continue to meet um, and work diligently about that. We'll probably have a report for you all uh, in January about that for publication. That's not for action. That's just for publication. But that um, that topic has generated more comment from um, the public than any other topic that we've had in recent memory in terms of written commentary coming in uh, to us. So that's an interesting item just to be aware of and alert for. And if you have questions, you can see any of us. Brian, of course, is the past master of that, he and Suzanne. The other item that attracted a considerable amount of attention, and this attention really came more from counselors than from the public, is that um, we were alerted to an issue, and it's highlighted on your agenda, with the amendment that deals with uh, uh, lawyers having sexual relations with their clients. This is really not about that topic as much because we've dealt with that one pretty explicitly. It's about the exchange of explicit material between counsel and client. Um, and we have some uh, situations where lawyers have actually tried to solicit information, uh, illicit photographs from clients, and there's actually no rule prohibiting that. And so there's a committee that is working on that uh, Carmen and Brian have jointly working on that between grievance uh, and ethics. And I had more volunteers for that subcommittee than any subcommittee we've ever put together. So uh, if you have interest in uh, joining that by Zoom, um, I'm sure we can make arrangements uh, for that. Um, but uh, Madam President, we have no action items. That's the report uh, of the Ethics Committee. Thank you. Any questions for David? Thank you. Matt Smith, please give us a report of the Grievance Committee. You know, one of these days I would not, I would really like not to follow David. I mean, really. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, speaking of David, while he and his committee were lounging around the hotel yesterday, the Grievance Committee came over here and did some hard work. Uh, we considered 328 items this quarter. 273 files were dismissed. Four were continued, two files were denied reconsideration, one lawyer was referred to LAP, ten lawyers were referred to Trust Account Compliance, three lawyers received letters of caution, eleven lawyers received letters of warning, five lawyers received admonitions, another five lawyers received reprimands, two received censures, and ten were sent to Disciplinary Hearing Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Matt? All right. Thank you, and thank you to those members of the Office of Counsel that are here. All right, I will turn it over now to Marcy Armstrong for the report from the Issues Committee. I know we're getting down the list here, so I'll try to make this brief, but we had two committees that were studying some very, very important issues, so I do please bear with me for a moment while I share the results of the, the hard work of those two committees. I know that many of you have heard this before in different committee meetings and you have had um, access to the materials, but there are maybe people that are joining us on live stream that, that may not have heard about the, the good work of these two committees. So first of all, um, the committee to study secured leave, and, and the reason that um, the issues committee studied that is because it goes straight to lawyers wellness, which we all know um, impacts the competency of lawyers. And I would like to thank um, Gordon Brown and, and his committee, as well as the staff members, Savannah Perry and Cameron Lee, for their hard work on, um, on that secured leave committee. So it, it just highlights of, of some of the significant um, recommendations that this committee came back in their report was to have a 20 days total per year um, for secured leave that you can take in increments of two days or more. Um, also, the notice, instead of 90-day notice, 45-day notice. Um, and then there's a discussion, a lot of discussion about um, how to report your secured leave. And it's um, the goal, I believe, to have a, a, a portal, maybe through the e-courts, I'm not sure how all that works, but um, where lawyers can go to one place and they can put in their secured leave. I mean, the study, the committee found that districts have varying procedures about how to go about um, you know, putting in their secured leave, and then there are a lot of lawyers practice in more than one district. So hopefully that is something else that can um, come to fruition at some point. But at this, the recommendations of this committee will be sent to the, um, to the Supreme Court, as well as to the administrative, let's see, Administrative Office of Administrative Hearings. I don't do administrative work. Hopefully I got that right. So anyway, thank you again for that good work and hopefully um, we'll see some of those recommendations adopted. Um, the other committee that did a, 
a impeccable job. I just I mean, can't think of the word to describe that. It was the committee to study the compensation of court appointed counsel. And that committee was led by Alan Cobb and staffed by Alex Nicely and Jennifer Slattery. And again, they did, did a fabulous job. And the product is something that I think the committee and the, and the bar, uh, state bar, can be very proud of. And that is a report that is in your materials. And this report um, just makes um, various recommendations about a very it's a serious problem. And, and I would like, I can't say it any better than the closing remarks in the reports. I'm going to read that again for the people that are hearing this in live stream so you will understand just how important this issue is. So the conclusions of this committee are the following. Alar an alarming number of attorney respondents reported, there was a survey, okay, just background for those listening live stream, there was a survey sent out to a number of different, different lawyers in, in, in um, the state. So an alarming number of lawyer attorneys responded that due to the size of their caseloads, they were unable to perform critical tasks with reasonable effectiveness. Moreover, attorneys' responses indicated that experienced attorneys are choosing to remove themselves for court, from court-appointed lists, contributing to the workloads of those attorneys remaining on the list and leaving a less experienced pool of attorneys to handle complex cases. When asked to explain their decision to remove themselves from court-appointed lists, a significant percentage of attorneys cited low compensation rates as a contributing factor. Based on the results of this survey, the committee is concerned that excessive caseloads may be hindering the ability of court-appointed counsel to effectively represent their indigent clients. I do not practice criminal law. I understand this is a huge problem with those that do practice criminal law. I do practice in the realm of family law, and I know that, that court-appointed counsel is needed in, in child support cases. So, and I'm sure in juvenile matters as well. So this is a very important issue. Um, and I'm just really proud of the, the report and the recommendations that are coming out of the, uh, the State Bar. Um, the Executive Committee um, approved yesterday a, a distribution of this uh, report to a number of stakeholders. And I, and I think I am gonna list those as well. So if you can listen to this list, if you can think of others that we need to um, distribute this report to. We're also going to be asking lawyers, um, each of you and any lawyers in the state, to also share this report with anybody that may be able to help with this issue. So at this time that we are distributing this report to the Chief Justice, the Chief Justice's Commission on Professionalism, the North Carolina General Assembly, IDS, North Carolina Bar Association, North Carolina Advocates for Justice, the North Carolina Association of Women Attorneys, the All the Black Lawyers Associations, the North Carolina Conference of Superior Court Judges, the North Carolina District Court Judges Conference, the North Carolina District Attorneys Association, Administrative Office of the Courts Director, Attorney uh, General Josh Stein, Governor Cooper's office, and anybody else that you feel can help resolve this issue, and I do appreciate all of you, appreciate the committees, and that's the report of the Issues Committee. Are there any questions for Marcy? She's correct. All of you, whether you're on the committee or not, should be proud of this work because it is very important to our profession. Thank you. And I'd like to call Mike Ramos up for the report of the LAMP Committee. Back in uh, July, July 17th of 1972 at 11 o'clock at night when I was stepping off that bus at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, if I told you, if you told me I'd be here up here 50 years later advocating for uh, military personnel, I'd say, you're nuts. <laughs> but, it, but it sticks with you. Uh, I'm the chairman of the LAMP Committee. We've been working really hard. We met last week uh, via Zoom. Uh, we've got a number of things going on. Um, we have not been able to ho hold any CLE in person just because of the COVID thing. But we do it in conjunction with um, U U UNC Law, and they're, they're just shut down for the time being. Uh, we're working now on updating. Uh, we have a virtual take one thing. These are pamphlets that are on our website, and they haven't been updated, some of them, since 1999. So we're like in doing that right now. I'd like to take this opportunity to really thank the advisory members of the LAMP committee. 
uh, who um, outnumber the counselors, really. And without them, we really couldn't do this because while the, you know, the element, the areas of law, kind of basic family law, wills, and that kind of stuff, when you get into that military environment, it gets really weird. And if you really want to have your head explode sometime, come and listen to Mark Sullivan talking about the equitable distribution of military pensions. That'll get your attention. So I'd like to really thank the, the advisory members, of course, Jennifer Porter, who is our staff liaison, but especially Mark Sullivan, uh, Mike Archer, uh, Burn Shields, who does our, uh, our, web, our website. So hopefully we'll have a report for you in January that we've got this all done. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And I just want to say thanks to both the uh, past and present members of our State Bar Council that have served our military. Thank you. Um, Warren, you want to come up and give us the report of the Distinguished Service Award? We call it the Happy Committee, which is why we put Warren in charge. All right, I'll, I'll dance a jig. Um, Madam uh, Barbara, <laughs> uh, <laughs> will you uh, please, I'd like to move to go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11 sub A2 to prevent the premature disclosure of a uh, honorary degree or similar award. All right. Give us just a minute to. You got a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 About things uh, and great lawyers in the state, the better. So. Uh, if you need any advice or help in putting together those nominations, contact me or Patrice or uh, Judge Cobb. Holy cow, the two that he did were, I'm going to use them as go-bys for uh, other people to use in uh, putting together uh, future nominations. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Warren. And uh, before I pass the figurative gavel to Darren Jordan, I just want to express my appreciation to soon-to-be past past president, Colin <laughs> Willoughby, and to say how much you'll be missed up here. try to be as solemn as I can. Uh, if I look like I'm jiggling my legs, it's because I've been drinking water up there for two hours. <laughs> I'd like to have a motion to uh, recess. <laughs> I think they call it a, a personal privilege. I think that's what we call it in court. Um, so Barbara, the, uh, the rest of the officers and I met, and we couldn't figure out whether we wanted to do the resolution or have David Allen sing the Barber Bunch. <laughs> I think we voted for the resolution, is that right? Because we've heard David sing before. So, okay, now the solemn part. This is a resolution of appreciation for Barbara R. Christie, our president. Whereas Barbara R. Christie was elected by her fellow lawyers from the Judicial District 18, now 24, in 2010 to serve as their representative in this body. She was thereafter re-elected counselor for two successive three-year terms. And whereas in October of 2018, Ms. Christie was elected vice president and in October of 2019 was elected president-elect. And on October 23rd of 2020, she was sworn in as president of the North Carolina State Bar. And whereas during her tenure with the North Carolina State Bar, Ms. Christie served on the following committees and boards, appointments, advisory committee, including as the vice chair and chair, authorized practice committee, including as vice chair, communications committee, distinguished service award committee, ethics committee, including as chair, 
Executive Committee, including his Vice Chair and Chair, Finance and Audit Committee, including his Vice Chair and Chair, Grievance Committee, including his Vice Chair, Issues Committee, including his Vice Chair and Chair, Legislative Committee, including his Vice Chair, the Lawyer's Assistance Program Board, the Dental Board Litigation Advisory Committee, the Disciplinary Review Two Committee, Special Committee to Study the Amendments to the ABA Model Rules on Advertising, Special Committee to Study Ethics 2020, and Special Litigation Committee. And whereas while serving as the State Bar Counselor, Ms. Christie participated in numerous significant initiatives of the State Bar, including two substantial revisions of the North Carolina Rules of Professional Conduct, construction of the new State Bar Headquarters, the successful adjudication of a major lawsuit against the State Bar, and an extensive review of the disciplinary process, to name but just a few. And whereas Ms. Christie demonstrated tremendous grace, patience, and good humor in accepting the vicissitudes of her presidential year, which began during a global pandemic that made face mask, social distancing, distancing, and size limitations on indoor gatherings, public health priorities, and necessitated the conversion of the October 2020 annual meeting from in-person to online. Regrettably, the traditional annual banquet at which a new president is sworn in with the pomp and circumstances attendant to that great honor was replaced with a small, socially distanced, mask swearing in ceremony at the State Bar Headquarters. Although only a few of President Christie's family members and friends could be present to see her take the oath of office, she didn't complain, but rather took the occasion to express her gratitude for her faith, her family, her vocation, and her opportunity to lead her fellow lawyers. And whereas President Christie provided calm, thoughtful, informed leadership by relying upon public health statistics and scientific evidence to guide the State Bar's response to the pandemic and to determine that the January and April 2021 quarterly meeting must be converted to virtual meetings. And whereas President Christie fulfilled one of the key responsibilities of her office by continuing and building upon the undertakings of her predecessor, including the facilitation and expansion of the following unprecedented initiatives, the study of regulatory changes that have the potential to improve access to justice for those who are financially unable to afford legal representation, the exploration of ways to improve diversity, inclusion, and equity in the profession and in the agency itself, studies of the intersection of lawyer competency with the court's secured leave policy, and the caseload and compensation of court-appointed attorneys. And the, and the revision of the rules of professional conduct and mandatory CLE requirements to encourage, assist, and support lawyers in fulfilling their professional responsibilities to seek equal justice for all. And whereas to ensure that all state bar leaders have a better understanding of the role and responsibilities of the state bar, President Christie fostered an atmosphere of collaboration among the leaders of the council, including officers and committee chairs. And whereas during the unique circumstances of her presidential year, President Christie was an unerringly and supportive of the members of the council and of the state bar staff and was the epitome of leadership from a place of quiet strength and persuasion by force of character and understated diplomacy. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the North Carolina State Bar does hereby and with deep appreciation express to Barbara R. Christie its debt for her personal service to the State Bar, to the people of North Carolina, to the legal profession, and for her dedication to the principles of leadership, integrity, professionalism, and equality. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be made a part of the minutes 
of the annual meeting of the North Carolina State Bar and that a copy be delivered to Barbara R. Christie. Thank you. Some of that water's leaking out. So. <laughs> Thank you. Now, as the last order of business, I'll ask past president, past, past, past president now, Colin Willoughby to escort the new vice president, Todd Brown, to the podium. Mm -hmm. This way, this way. <laughs> and past president Willoughby says you have to sit in the audience. Thank you. <laughs> Let's welcome Todd Brown. Unless anybody wants to hear David sing, um, we are adjourned.